Welcome everyone who's uh, just tuning in. This is Cheers Yo episode 9. Today we have Jeff Glass on the podcast. Jeff is the homie who, you guys see me shred this rig every day. Well, this reclaim catcher right here that I catch all of my reclaim in, Jeff made it. Um, and so, yeah, Jeff, if you want to give everyone a little spiel about what you do and where they could find your artwork really quick, it'd be great to see you. All right. Well, yeah, so I'm uh, Jeff Glassart. I make the original silicone reclaimer. It's basically, a, you know, an attachment that goes on under your banger to catch all the oil that you would slurp down with your banger. And instead of it clogging up the rig or, you know, making a mess, and it just collects straight into the silicone puck. And then the silicone puck is the easiest thing to ever get the reclaim back out of. So now uh, my recentest drop was through Inhale Bliss 365 on Instagram. If you guys want to check out Inhale Bliss 365, you can see some of my latest pieces. He's got some full color and some clear, and uh, they even got some of the R cubes and the rigs. I got full rigs with them attached to it as well, so that if you don't have a rig already and you're looking at into a rig, you can get one with a reclaimer already built in. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Yeah, and then exactly like someone in the chat said, and then you can just eat it right out of the exactly. puck if you want to. Just eat it. Yeah. And that's the thing is like, yeah, I guess there's a lot of confusion where some people think that it's to smoke it again. And that is a potential. Like if you're fiending and you need to be able to take a dab and that's all you got, I mean, it's not going to kill you. But the best part about it is, is it's all decarb. You've already gone through the process of like smoking it and enjoying it once. And so waste not, want not, you know, you don't have to throw it away. You can totally turn it into edibles. And they're the best edibles because you know exactly what we're into. Edibles, 100%. 100%. And they're really nice. It has a good... Uh, uh, some people say they're really high in CBN, so sometimes they make certain people kind of sleepy. But I fucking love the high from it. Like, I make all my edibles with my Reclaim. Since I got my Reclaim catcher, I've probably saved, like, 60 grams of Reclaim. You know? Yeah, dude, it builds up so quick. It's insane. And the clarity of it, too, depending on what it is that you're smoking, you know, a lot of people are always complaining, oh, you know, it's real dark and gross or whatever. It just depends what you started with, you know? If you smoke some dark, and dark stuff to start with, of course it's going to come out dark. 100%. But smoking like, I was going to say, yours is all yeah, right here. Beautiful, I got some man. kind of hairs some attached to like, No way, that's got to be a distillate or something, you know? Right. But all that would have wound up in the water. And, like, once you get water in the oil, you're just done for. It's going to get moldy. It's gross. It's just. Yeah, I don't fuck with that. Certain people do a certain thing where they, like, take their uh, rig water and they like, pour it in an iso bath or something and they dissolve the. And they keep. They somehow distill their oil or whatever. I'm like, fuck that, dude. I'm not yeah. using any oil that touches water. I say, fuck that. I feel like it could grow mold so fast. So oh, and it that. does too, man. It's so gross. Like, you just close the puck and, and like, all of a sudden, you're like, oh, man. That's fucking nasty. Oof. Gnarly as fuck. All right, let's start it off with a dab. Yeah, absolutely. What are you dabbing on today? Oh, shit. Okay, hold on. I'll show you as soon as I get this heated up. I have three yeah, different yeah. strains out. Wait, four different strains out. Ooh, I brought sweet. The flavors. Nice, nice. What you got? What you got today that you're dabbing down on? Uh, I got some of uh, the homies Power Wreck. It's uh, some saucy goodness, man. He, he brought me this stuff that's like, have you ever had the dabs that are almost too terpy where it kind of like burns a little bit? Oh, yeah. Oh, that's saucy yeah. as fuck. Exactly. Where it's like, it's just all soupy and goopy. And so, I mean, it's delicious. Don't get me wrong, but it like, it Oh, like, no it way! Like, are you fucking kidding right me now. right now? My God. Seriously, I think that as soon as you get over... For me, it's like about 12 or 13% terps. I'd say once you get 15 to 20% terps, that's when you start, like, you feel it in your nose. If you take three, for me, if I take three dabs back to back of something like that, my throat will just be fucking wrecked, bro. Yeah. Literally absolutely. wrecked. But I could dab stuff like this all day. This is what I'm dabbing on one of the jars, anyways. This yeah, is some Burner's Cut Girl Scout cookies right here. Ooh, that looks dang. That's it, greasy. Oh yeah, like, super greasy. Well, the thing is, I used to think, I thought, you know, CRC, right? How like some stuff is ran CRC, it has the, the extra filtration. That's what this is. And I thought for the longest time, this was my perception on, CR on CRC was that it's only good for budget product. Yeah. And this homie proved me wrong, dude. He's like, he's like, here, take a dab of this. And I'm like, what the fuck? This tastes 
it's good as fuck. And he's like, he's like, yeah, dude, people are just doing CRC wrong. They're just packing entire columns of CRC instead of just like a little fucking thing of it, you know, and people are using Yeah, my homie was talking about that. That color remediation is all you're going for. You're not trying to slurp the turps out, you know. Hundred percent. So I think there's some people doing it right, but most people aren't. Yeah, and I think like a lot of CRC has that kind of flavor where I think it's uh, like a pinene or one of the terpenes comes through first, mm -hmm. and so they all kind of have a similar like uh, there's no back end to it; it's all front end, you know. It tastes kind of just like <laughs> like either like a lemon cleaner or like Sunny D. Ooh. Mm. Yeah, I'm personally a big fan of BHO. There's a lot of people that are really big rosin fans, but to me, I prefer a BHO. I do as well. I think it's a little cleaner. I think that the, the cleanliness part of it is debatable on whether or not solvents and plant matter are worse for you. But I would imagine that uh, <coughs> I feel like it's more of a uh, un unaltered product in the distillation with a, a solvent. When you're pulling it out, you're pulling everything you do want and nothing that you don't want. And with that rosin, there's always those unwanted fats and waxes and whatnot that are squeezing out with it. It's and so it gives you a different flavor. Yep. And I don't know about you, but after I smoke like a gram or two of some hash rosin, I'll notice that I'll cough up phlegm, dude. Like I have a fucking cold or something. I'll literally just cough up fucking loogies. It's crazy. I always tell people it reminds me of uh, somebody already burnt my cookies. You know, like fucking uh, the weed flavor is always, no matter how crisp and fresh the rosin is made from, it always has like it's been hit once already. Flavor. Yeah, yeah, it does. It does. It has that, it has that almost like the, you know, like when you vaporize fucking weed, it's like that yeah. popcorn flavor almost. Exactly. That's exactly what Jake was saying yesterday. It's funny, like verbatim, we were talking about it. And it was like, yeah, totally that vaporized burnt popcorn flavor. And like, granted, you can do it low enough temperature and high enough pressure that that's not a constant, but it's like, it's a background flavor that's just always there. Yeah, 100%, 100%. Yeah, I've definitely had some dabs of hash rosin that I was like, oh, wow, that's incredibly terpy. But you can still tell. You can tell. Yeah, and it's like, it's good, but for the amount of effort that goes into it, it's just not worth it to me, you know? 100%. Yeah, I agree with you. All right, I got a question for you. What's when that? did you start blowing glass? And did somebody teach you how to blow glass, or did you teach yourself? Oh, man, so this goes back to, like, I think I was, like, 12 or so. And you know the guys that do the windshield repair? They, like, fix the cracks in your windshield. They, like, show up, and they got, like, a little epoxy gun and everything. So they have a little tiny, like, a butane torch, like the dab torches we use now that they heat the glass up with first. And so when I was like 12, my dad was having a windshield repaired. And the guy, when he left, he left that little butane torch on top of the car. And he took off. And I was like, oh, can I have that torch, you know? And my dad's like, well, what are you going to do with it? You know, it's like, what do, you, what do you do with a torch? You like burn stuff, you know? So he's like, well, you know, I guess be careful. And he gave me a little torch. So like, I just started burning everything, man. I was like, fucking burn this, burn that. <laughs> and like, I broke a, like a sliding glass door, like one of those tall, giant pane uh, glass doors it had fallen over and it exploded into a million pieces and i thought i was like well fuck can i melt one of those pieces you know and i started like hitting it in the torch and i started melting up like a stick of glass that had broken out of the window onto another one and i realized at that point that like you could totally melt glass and like stick it together so i got super excited about it and started like sculpting like just little things with broken windows and a, and a propane torch or butane torch and when i showed my uncle He's a stained glass artist, and he told me about the entire glass world of glass blowers and everything. And then for that Christmas, he bought me a little, like, a propane torch and some soft glass rods and that book on how to blow glass. And so I sat there and, like, learned how to do it with all these, like, things. Like, back before YouTube was, like, a thing where you could go look up a tutorial of how to do a wigwag or something like that. There were, like, books with, like little drawings and whatnot, you know? And so that's where I started, was just totally by chance when I was a little kid, just fucking with shit and, like, melting stuff, being a pyro that, you know, any 12-year-old would be. 
<laughs> yo, that's fucking crazy. That's so awesome. That's that's yeah. epic, yo. That's fucking. Uh, that's a great present too for a kid, yo. That's crazy. Dude, it was amazing. It changed my life absolutely. It was literally at that point I knew this is what I want to do. Like I want to melt glass because there's something so hypnotic about it. They're like, you ever get stuck in a lava lamp? I'm like yeah, fucking. Yeah, yeah. like, oh man, saying. it's just, it's mesmerizing and beautiful. That's glass blowing all day, all the time. It's just like you're watching those blobs change and move and flow in this like perfect way with gravity and heat. And then when you're in control of it, you just feel like, you know, this fucking master of fucking physics. You're like, oh my god, I'm making like this like solid material liquid and shaped and then it's solid again and now we can smoke out of it you know yeah, it's fucking crazy dude honestly it's a, it's one of the craziest forms of artwork that there is straight up it's definitely a cool medium are you familiar uh you ever watch the mythbusters the adam and jamie fucking yeah. that that couple they do a whole uh like a little documentary thing on fucking uh the glass age how like we kind of live now in the glass age where different ages are, are like classified throughout history by the material they master. So the stone age, the iron age, the bronze age, it's each different metals. Now we live in the glass age where we're mastering the glass material in the way that microchips are fucking, they're glass, dude. They're laser carved little pieces of glass and shit. And now like glass artists and everything are making these amazing pieces it's all just a, a finer yeah. form of mastery of glass. Yeah, it's crazy. It's honestly fucking insane how much the glass industry has developed just over the past fucking ten years. Like, it's insane. What what was ahead of you know ten years ago compared to what people are making now? Just, oh, absolutely. And the fact that there are people that are learning from the people that started it all. They're the ones that are really expanding it because they're not uh, confined by the original like uh, rules and mindset. When you like learn glass, there's a lot of things they're told you can and can't do and you should and shouldn't do. And when you don't have those restrictions and boundaries, you make things that people didn't believe were possible. And it's so cool to see that now. Definitely. Yeah, I've seen some crazy fucking shit where it's like, wait a minute. You know, and I've, I've fucked around with glass. I've blown some glass to myself. And some things that people pull off, it's just, I'm like, how did you do that without having that crack a million times? Especially kind of with some sculpturing, some sculpture fucking shit, dude. I don't, I don't understand It's heat based, that. man. It's like, once you get the glass to a certain temperature, like you've used like dabbers to break up pull and snap like a bunch before. And so that temperature that you have the pull and snap at makes like such a different uh, consistency for when it's going to snap off, whether or not you can draw lines in it, crack it up, or whether or not it just explodes when you poke it. And the same thing goes for glass. So like the consistency, once you hit a thousand degrees is like pull and snap at, at like 90 degrees where you can't really snap it unless you try, you know, if you move it really hard and really fast, it'll crack still. But the glass, like it's in that amorphous, like almost jelly like state. And so you never have to worry about a crack running through it. You have to worry more about it starting to slump out of its original shape. And then you just learn to like ride that balance of a comfortable level of how hot the piece is and how long you can withstand being around it while it's doing that. You know? Definitely. Yo, that totally makes sense. Yeah, I have no, uh, no uh, concept of that balance for sure yet. And it's something that I'm a little bit working on. I think that takes years hundred percent. Yeah. Well, it, it depends too. Cause like seeing some of the kids these days that started two or three years ago that are at levels of like glass blowers that are, have been doing it for 20 years and beyond, they're able to just like, I think that um, a lot of it too is video games. The dexterity that like your hands have is really key to being able to blow glass. It's how can you correlate what your mind's eye sees to making your fingers do it and so when you're playing like a video game you're doing that exact same technique you're trying to correlate what your eye sees to what your hand is doing and it increases those skills dramatically they make like like uh you know those uh dexterity style games and whatnot like operation and shit back when you're a kid because it did the same kind of thing they didn't have video games so you need to learn hand-eye coordination skills so you played Monopoly, mousetrap, you know, operation, things like that. 
now we got all these point and click adventures and Xbox controllers that kids fingers are just naturally talented at creating. True. Holy shit, yeah. That's crazy. I didn't even think about that. Yo, I think that I am going to take another dab right now. Yeah, that sounds like a plan. What are you hitting this time? I think we're going to go in on... Oh, dude, did I fucking... Did I forget to show what I was dabbing last time I did, eh? Oh, uh, well, there was that, that uh, PRC oh, stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I showed you that Girl Scout cookies. Okay. Yeah. Let's go. Yeah, yeah that's that something else different. right there? Is that the same jar? Yeah, so, no, here, this is another jar. This is uh, uh, another similarly kind of too terpy, but still really good stuff. It's uh, blueberry, tasty. blueberry something cross. I can't remember the name Ooh, of it. Yo, another... blueberry is so nice. Oh, yeah, it's a great flavor, man. It's like, I like, okay, so in terpene flavors, I like ones like candy, man. I like the sweet, sugary ones. I don't like oh, the yeah, greasy feet you. ones, you know, like GMO and stuff. Those are all, like, weird to me. Hey, I like a good GMO for sure, but if you hand me, like, fucking... My favorite strain of all time, Strawberry Cough. Yeah, it's delicious. Oh, so right. good. It's insane. Like, so have you ever had a GMO or a garlic that tasted like, uh... I don't know if, if you've ever smoked or smelled DMT before. Oh, that looks delicious. This nice. This is some Chernobyl right here. So this one's super, like, limey. Like a mm. like a lime citrus. Yeah, like super citrusy. Ooh, my forehead's already sweating, dude. <laughs> yeah, you know it's going. You're like, all right. Okay, okay. Drop this blueberry in. Oh yeah, yeah. That blueberry terp is definitely one of my favorites. I still remember this. This uh, it was an eighth of uh, indoor blueberry that I bought as soon as I went to college at U of O, and it was like still some of the dankest weed I've had to this day. It's like just open the bag and you just, oh, that's crazy. <laughs> so rad. So good. Cheers, yeah. How do you like that rig? <coughs> the chug is so nice. It's a real nice deep chug. Too, you know? That's such a beautiful piece, too. I love how the water level is defined by the sculpture. Oh, yeah. <coughs> Just touches right there. I could put a tiny bit more in it. But... Ooh. It's so good. That one has a little nose burner. Those nostrils tingling. Oh yeah, man. Mm. Some of them terps, derby terp. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Ah, it's delicious. So where did you uh, get the idea to make the reclaimer? Okay, so uh, I don't know when you started taking dabs, but back in like 2004, 2006 or so, they started getting kind of popular up in in like Washington here. And the oil, like, that, when they came, it would come in, like, a little, like, a plastic container with a piece of parchment paper or something like that. Just, like, mm -hmm. have a piece of, because shatter was, like, the only thing that anybody knew how to make, you know? And so there was, like, one day, I think it was, like, 2008-ish or so, um, I was, like, so, so tired of having the oil in my rig and the oil coming down from, we were using nails back in the day, not even bangers, right? So, like. When you slurp the oil, it goes right down that nail and it goes right down the joint and into the rig. And that was pretty much just the way it was designed and you just had to deal with it. So back in the day, I found uh, an oil company that sold their oil in a little silicone puck. And it was like, it was a makeup puck back in the day is the way they were selling it or whatever. It was like a silicone makeup container. But they figured out that when you put oil in it and whatnot, it didn't stick to it. So it was like, perfect. And I just thought, how do I put that oil back in that puck when I'm done smoking it, you know? I was like, there's got to be a way because it came out so easy where, like, if it ever, the oil ever got on a glass container or a plastic container, you were done for, man. It just would not come back out. It's like, yeah. fucking, especially because there was no butter or anything back in the day that you could, like, scrape off. It was always shatter. And it just, oh, like, and huge. shatter reclaim, too, is super annoying to deal with, too. Oh, oh yeah. It's just, like, the worst. And oh, so... Eventually, uh, I went to one of the stores that I was buying glass from, 
And I had one of those silicone pucks in my pocket from buying oil recently, but it was empty. And I was looking at the shelf of glass that had all the different tubes on it. And I was thinking, wouldn't that be cool if this little puck just fit in the end of one of those? And it totally did. And it was like one of those like fucking sword in the stone moments to just like, ah, so perfect. It fucking worked That's out. Awesome, yo. I knew then I was like, there has to be a combination of parts that can make this work. And originally, Riggs came with a male joint and then the nail sat on that. So I put a male joint on top of that tube and then another female joint off of that so it would sit onto the piece. But with the like nails and things back in the day, it would make your nail like two and a half, three inches taller. And like some of the rigs were already nose burners. And so it was really like this like awkward kind of thing, but it worked on the bigger rigs. So if you had like a big 18, then you could use the like reclaimer off the front of that. And it totally didn't make it too tall. And it wasn't until finally uh, the, the domeless nail, when the first domeless nails came out, like uh, Quartz Castle, and uh, I used to make one out of Boro, basically. You just like push a Maria in a tube and just open the top of it. And then it was like, same thing as like, uh, like a Quartz Castle or a bucket or anything now. But the uh, once the bangers really came out, that's when that female joint became standard. And I knew then that like being able to to put the doer into the tubing, the, the, a doer is the joint that's down inside of the, the glass instead of externally. Like if a joint's sticking out like the side of the bong, that's just a regular one. But the, the one that goes into the reclaimer, it's called a doer because of the seal at the top. I put that doer joint on top of that tubing and that silicone puck, and they're all exactly the same diameter already manufactured perfectly. And I was like, this is it this is the combo. That's the one. And that was like, what, 2014, 2013, something like that. After like five years of making them the other way around, when like bangers became the standard, that's when the silicone reclaimer that we know and love today is like, was just made. Definitely. Yeah. Is, is that when they really took off too? Because it was just, it kind of like worked out, you know, because people, I, I remember people used to do drop downs, you know, and that's how people yeah. would be like, oh, I reclaim, click my reclaim from the drop down. But, that is such a bitch, dude. You fucking torch that and you torch that and you torch that and then you grab this part and you're like, oh, fuck, it's still fucking hot, bro. <laughs> you're like trying to like fucking finagle it from the fucking corner and shit. Oh. My homies used to put their rigs and their drop downs in the oven and then put like a parchment paper underneath them in the oven and just heat it up and let everything drip out of the rigs and the parch onto the parchment oh. paper. I was like, dude, there has to be a better way, man. There has to be a better way. Oh, then, yeah. yeah, so it was like one of those, like, I've always been super cheap, man. I grew up really poor and didn't ever have anything. So I was like, man, I want to save everything that I can that's, like, worthwhile. And so the reclaimer was kind of like a, you know, a necessity is the mother of invention kind of thing. It's like, I need to find a way to solve this problem. And it totally worked out. Definitely. And then, Turns out that other people have a similar problem. I was like, oh, okay, cool. Well, now, like, everybody likes this kind of thing because it solves, like, just a general problem with a lot of rigs. And being removable is kind of a nice thing, too, because then you can have the, the piece and put it on the different rigs that you want to hit out of, and you don't necessarily have to have a reclaimer on every rig as well. It just kind of goes around with the banger. It's, like, part of the banger, you know? 100%. Yeah, it's interchangeable. So exactly. nice. Seriously. Yeah. I love that. That was a really nice story. I'm so Thanks, man. amazed. I realize that the last dab is kicking in. Um, yeah. It's creeping up on stuff. me. You know what I'm saying? Um, damn. Yeah, yeah so uh, really... here's a, a fun one. Uh, one time this guy who's in my septic tank pumper, he came and he was telling me that if you want to make a, a business with longevity, you know, that you have to deal with the food industry or the poop industry because those are things that people will never stop doing, eating and pooping. And I was like, oh, man, that's really cool, but I want to blow glass, you know? <laughs> and he's like, no, like, you're missing my point, you know? He's like, you, you got to find the poo in what you do, you know? He's like, fucking everybody's got something that they're willing to pay you to get rid of, you know, or they don't want to deal with their manage because it's really gross and everything. And so the reclaim has kind of become that that thing 
in the industry of like the rigs and dabs and everything is that's the gross part that you really don't want to have to deal with much. And if it's all managed by this nice little silicone fucking container piece, then it's just oh, so much less hassle in general. It's been one of my like driving points behind it was the septic tank pumping guy one day just like inspired me to like keep going with something like this. It's like, thanks man. Thank you. So you're the master Boro poop cleaner. Basically, man. Wow. And it's funny because, like, a lot of people, like, give people shit for, like, being, like, a, you know, a plumber or septic tank worker or something. But it's like, imagine how hard your life would be if you didn't have a bathroom. Like, fucking, that shit needs to be kept up by somebody. Everybody's got a poop. And in the same retrospect, everybody's got reclaim. Yeah. And then... Food industry is the other side of it where you got to make the oil in the first place, man. Somebody's got to be out there making the dank tank to be able to smoke to make free clear. This is true. This so is I was true. like, right on, you know. And I don't have to try and, like, be all of it or anything. I can just be that part that, that perfectly encapsulates the reclaim. And, well, you and everybody... know what? You do both. If you, <laughs> if you make a rig with a reclaimer, are you then dealing with the food and the poop? They say well, don't shit maybe. where you eat, but you have done it in a masterful way. <laughs> if I made some, like, dank oil or something, and then the dank rig, and then the dank reclaim all together, and then dank edibles all the way through, you go from food to food, man. It's a whole, it's the circle of life. Single source, full loop right there. I think that that would be, that, that if you did that, you would be. You could make a claim that you have the world record at the highest tier single source production. You made the rig. You then, you then took the reclaim, made some edibles. Oh, dude, that. Would oh be... man. So back in the day, that used to be one of the things that provided me like a good amount of uh, income in the glass industry was making those blasting tubes. I remember when people used to just open blast like with a big old fucking glass tube. Oh, yeah, and with the little, little. just the little nib and they just fucking shove a fucking, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I used to make these ones where I would take and put a, a big giant, like, uh, like a bong mouthpiece on one end and on the other end. So it's like double ended. Oh, that looks delicious. And make it so that like you could strap this big rubber cork into the top and then like strap a coffee filter around the bottom of it. And then the cork method made it so, like, everybody used to have such a hard time cleaning those things out. You have to, like, have a coat hanger down through that little hole and, like, poke all the weed out of it. So I just made one that had a big cork in it. But, like, if you didn't strap that cork down with the hose clamp right, you know, I'm fucking going to just blow right out of there and shit. It was just so funny, like, thinking about all the people back in the day, like, making oil in their garage with, like, this big old hunk of glass tube and shit. I wonder how many of those are laying around. In like people's garages still that their kids are gonna find them and just be like, what the hell is this? Like it smells like their fucking- kids are gonna try to use it as a bong or something. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's a giant glass blunt. <laughs> that would be so ridiculous. Oh, that's too funny. I saw this one guy. They made a like a sixteen. I don't know. It was sixteen or like twenty foot bong in their shop. Oh place. my god! It's I think it's rad glass. Is what it is. I saw it on his story. It's literally for like their entire studio. It like goes to the top of their warehouse. That's so, so funny. funny. Like, That'd be so it. ridiculous. I couldn't but even it's imagine. Almost, like, it's a novelty thing that just because, man, you gotta do it just because. Right? Why not, you know? <laughs> yeah, if you have the ability to. That's one of the fun things about like being a glass artist in some ways. Like you get any idea that you like come up with. You can just kind of be like, oh, okay, let's go give it a shot, you know, let's see if it works or not. Definitely. <laughs> Being a pothead and a glass artist is a really fun combo. Because, like, there's a lot of glass artists that are in the glass world that don't even smoke. They're just really into the glass, you know, and it's really cool. And they make amazing stuff, but I feel like the people that are in it for function have like these crazy ideas in their head that just like being manifested in glass is so phenomenal. I totally agree. I think that's where the best ideas come from. Honestly. Do you have a rig design that you've never seen you'd like to see made? I have a, I have a notebook that has some, some rig designs that are some pretty crazy ones. 
Uh, let's see, it might be over here. Yeah, see, you got any cool artwork to show off? Some rig artwork? He used to have a homie, Niff Diggity, that he would paint people's like signature rigs. It was a really cool thing. Yo, yeah. I've seen some of those. Um, I don't know about, probably from him actually. Was were they like little? Mm. There was this one person that did like, little tiny drawings of rigs that were like really, oh, really wow. cool drawings of them. It's super cool. That's yeah, awesome. I wish I knew what his Instagram was. That's right, everybody. Uh, that's funny. My my shopmate Jake says that's likely his buddy actually. Oh shit! I, I bet it might be. Yo, he actually uh, he drew one of my rigs way back when it was a a time piece. You know, time time one. The guy who makes like the birds and stuff. It was like oh yeah 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 yeah. It was Carl the coal mining canary, and it was this canary that had a coal mining hat, and he had like this fucking super G pose. It was really cool. Kind of still. Let me see, is this the notebook? Okay, so well, this is this is kind of a fun little. Oh, let's see here. Oh, that's fucking dope. This is blast off. Hell yeah! And then, yeah, yeah, I can these totally are just some see that. Tootsie rolls eating some people. <laughs> I don't know. That's fucking hilarious. Yeah, I could totally see that. That'd be fucking awesome. It's like a Duber rig. Oh yeah, okay. These are just little doodles. I I have oh, like, yeah. a thing with rigs somewhere. I like, know, that's cool. It's awesome art too. I could totally see like we could totally try and do a thing where like uh you can do some like art on a rig or something. Oh yo, I actually I have some these are like some little doodles that I wanted to do eventually as disc flips and I did like Oh um, hell yeah. Colors on them and shit. Ah, oh, that'd be so dope. Dragon and shit. That's not crap. These ones would be kind of... They'd be really hard, though, to do, but, like, someone, some easier ones, like, this would be, like, a fucking, like... Oh, yeah, like yeah. Alien with... Yeah, with the, like, colored border and everything. Yeah. Hell, yeah, dude. That'd be so much fun. Doing those disc clips is a trip. Actually, here, I'll grab a section here. I'll show you. Yeah. Hang on. A cut and clip. Oh, yeah. This is a, this is a fun one right here. A little mushroom. Oh, yeah, a little mushroom. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. That'd be so much fun. Yeah, you gotta try one of these days. Get back in the studio. Yo, yeah, I have. I've done one disc flip before, and I have it somewhere in my boxes. I don't know where. So I got this one here. This is a. Uh, I did a cut and flip of Buttercup from that's Power. Fire. <laughs> that's super that's cool, like. Though. It's like probably three inches tall or so. And I did this like two years ago and I've been terrified to use it ever since because I'm afraid I'm going to break it. And I'm just like, it kills me. I'm like, oh my God, it went so good. I don't want to fuck it up. And Yo, before wanna, like, you do that, do it. another warm up where you do another piece with a similar section, right? And then Oh like, yeah, come, absolutely. Like, and then you're like, yeah, okay. yeah, I was thinking I got to like even try and redo it and do it better so that like I can be like, oh shit, I gotta use that one to warm up to use this one, you know? Definitely, yo. Fuck yeah, that'll be perfect. There you go. Okay, so yeah, this is... Here. Oh, see here, there's some uh, Jake doing a doer. Yo, that piece is lit. Yeah, it's a big old bubble dumper. He's been making a turf flute for a couple years. And this is a bubble dumper edition, a recycler style. Oh, I like that. Looks like it functions very, very nicely. Thank you. Yeah, here, let's see. I got one on the table right over here. I can throw some bubbles through for you real quick. Oh, yeah. Oh, nice. I like that. That's a that's a really nice base to it, too. Oh, yeah, it's got some cool perfectly stuff. Too. Yeah, let's see here what it's Nate working on right now. Now, just starting to work on the lathe. It's going to be putting together another recycler. Yeah. Mind if I pull one of yours out of the kiln real quick? Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, here, I'll pick one of these up. Yeah, check this out. So Nate here makes these gill cyclers. Oh, that's that they so have the, the gill climb section on it. They got the gill uptakes. They got a gill uh, off the joint here. It's got like a four hole slit perk that's double bridge, so it's like 12 holes. And then nice little water break up on top. This one's full color. Nice. This is Chubby what Class by that? Nate. This one is Solara? Or is it, no? No, it's a, it's a really cool color. 
Yeah, it's beautiful. It's nice. It's like it's it's the it's subtle, you know. It's not like an aggressive color. It's just so it's Nate nice. does blow clean as fuck, yo. Colors. He takes us. Oh, okay. So here, it's a little section of this color. Whatever this color is here. Oh, okay. So it's Tangelo, probably. Yeah, it's a. Uh, and yeah, so then he'll do a blow in with it, where you take that and then uh, you blow it up into a bubble inside of another tube. Well, it sticks to the walls of that other tube, and it'll coat the entire tube in that color and make a blank that's now like. You know, here I'll pull one out of the kiln here. I'll show you. So this here is a section of glass blown inside of another section of glass, nice. and that will color all of that glass, all that same color evenly, and only use up. Okay, right, here Nate, I'll take it and warm it up. What color is that? And it'll make all that glass one even, consistent color with only having to use like one tenth the glass that a solid piece of color would be. It makes it so much more. It's cost effective, and and uh, you can do some cool color patterns you can't really get in like tubing already. Definitely, yo, I love that. That's fire. I like that color that you're working with right there too. Yeah, that's probably a greasy satin in there. This is a greasy satin uh, opal rainbow. Satin opal rainbow. rainbow. <laughs> it's a mouthful, that's for sure. Rainbow yeah. hydro blue satin. Rainbow Hydro Blue Satin. Oh, wow. That is quite the color. <laughs> yeah, and the satins are phenomenal colors. They make like that, that uh, what they call chatoyancy, where like when you change the angle of the piece, you get like the lines of shimmer in it. Oh, definitely. Definitely where it has almost like the dichro feel. Yeah, yeah. It's like kind of like a bunch of super, super tiny dichro. Like one of the best ways to explain it is like you ever see like the fancy shampoo where it, like, has all the little tiny, like, swirly pearlescent color in it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it totally looks like shampoo. My buddy Connor always loves, like, he's like, oh, yeah, it's like Ninja Turtle shampoo, that green satin. It looks so cool. <laughs> That's one crazy. of my Oh, you know favorites. what? I think I've seen some of that green satin. I know exactly what you're talking about now. It looks yeah, like shampoo it looks for like sure. <laughs> shampoo. Yeah, it's just like, whoa, that's so cool. So again, and so like all of greasy colors pretty much have that. It's a, a percentage of tin in the glass that makes little tiny tin crystals. And then when you stretch and move the glass, you distort the the arrangement of the tin crystals in it and it makes those satiny looks you get that the light shimmer off of it mm. okay okay i see i see yeah glass is one of those real nifty things where again like the science behind it gives us all sorts of cool stuff like they're just now coming out with the polychromic tones where like we've had cool shifties and uvs and whatnot <laughs> but now ones where depending on the angle of the light passing through the glass, will determine the color of the glass. Oh, so when you look straight at it, it'll be one color, and you look at it from the side, it'll be another color, all in the same lighting. And oh. it's like, oh. Yeah, without oh. having to switch lighting. Exactly. How, That's how different of colors is that shift on the spectrum? Um, it's so far, the only bit that I've noticed is like, from green to yellow and enough where it's like emerald and gold, where like it's substantially different enough at the right angle that it's the full length of the tubing is gold and then turned at a slight angle, it's all green now. And it all in the same sunlight. That's pretty crazy. That's crazy yeah, as fuck. It's, it's, it's gonna be insane to see what they do with that, honestly. <laughs> yeah, it's just the next cool thing where like, you know, it seems like every year had a thing like UV was a year, and then CFL was a year, and then Dicro was a year. And fuck, now it's like, it's hard. Well, Crushed Opal, yeah, that definitely had a year, you know? Oh, yeah. Crushed Opal is still one of those ones that, like, it's so hard not to be in love with it, but it's so hard to want to work with it as an artist. You know what sucks? I have a piece in my uh, closet that was a $1,000 piece, or, or so, maybe like $800 or something like that, and it's a pretty dope piece. The bottom of it's mm, crushed opal, and it has an Illuminati window in the middle. Mm -hmm. The crushed opal, it's like kind of the chunky crushed opal, right? There's a crack. I hadn't shredded the piece in six months, and I was showing it to one of my homies, and he pulls it out, and he goes, you know this piece was cracked on the bottom? And I was like, no, really? No and he's like, 
He's like, yeah. And he shows it to me, and it's literally from one crushed opal to another, the entire way through the Illuminati section, just boom. Perfect. Oh, my God. Son of a bitch. Right? Exactly. It's like, yo, there's nothing you can do about that. And I contacted the homie, and he's like, he's like, well, does that piece hold water? And I was like, yeah. And he's like, like, I can try to repair it, but there's like a probably a fifty percent chance that piece is gonna blow up. He's like, or you yeah, can exactly. use Eat it back up till the Boom. water. Yeah, he's like, you can use it until the water goes, and then maybe I could potentially put another bottom on it if I get lucky. But yeah, for real, like though that uh, windshield repair stuff, honestly, it would be your best bet on fixing that thing. Is just put some of that windshield repair epoxy in it, and it'll seal that crack up. Like you can't even see it in it anymore. But because it's crushed opal, it's one of those things like the risk of fixing it, man. Like you're saying, you're better off using it until it breaks, breaks, than trying to fix it while it's just flawed. 100%. Crushed opal is a fucking a bitch. Seriously. Yeah, you know? dude, it sucks. Like, But it's fun at the same time because of how it looks. But like, oh, man, did you ever see that, uh, that Banksy painting? That like when they auctioned it off, the Banksy painting like went through a shredder in its frame yeah. and it's good. So you see the meme that was like, ah, oh, Banksy thinks he was the first artist to create self-destructing artwork. And then it shows, like, crushed opal pieces. It was like, <laughs> oh, that's so funny. Like, totally, man. That's so ridiculous. That's so true, though. They're time bombs. That's literally Absolutely. all... Really, realistically, all opal encasements are time bombs. Pretty but much. If they're done very, very well, they're very longitudinal time bombs that won't explode within your lifetime. Yeah, if exactly. It, if it's crushed opal, that's a time bomb that's going off in your lifetime, 110%. You never know, man. I mean, sometimes you can have a perfect balance of stress like uh, tempered windows, too, where, like, somehow the right amount of stress is involved in it where it's just not ready to break anytime soon. It's actually like a integrity where like stress makes it stronger. Okay. So okay, I see what you're saying. There's, there's a possibility. Okay, I think you're right. It's possible. It's possible to have one. That very works. unlikely though. Very okay, unlikely. Very unlikely. But I think. Oh, you got to see the, the homie Jake's got this giant rig he made the other day. Yo, that's lit. Ooh. Yeah, it's got like a 30 hole what, perk in it. I was going to say, what perk is that? That looks insane. Yeah, so Jake cut a disc into like several sections and then bridged those sections with uh, Nora's gold ruby. And then now check this out. He's got the pull carb fucking nail <laughs> action. I love that. Because there's no way that you can clear that thing through a 10 mil nail. It's totally got to be the pull carb. <laughs> That's lit, yeah. I love right? that. That piece is fire. That's great. I love I love the deep chug. I mean, you know, you know what piece I'm shredding. Yeah, for sure. Let's take another dab. Let's get it. Yeah, I'm down. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, so I got another question for you while we're getting ready to take this dab. Yeah, what's that? Where'd you get your robe? Oh, okay. So this is a funny one for sure. Where, um, so the house that I live in now, I got when I split up with the gal that I bought it with. And when she left, she left a bunch of her junk here, just like fucking computer monitor and printer and just like, oh shit, you got to take to the dump when you're just like, ah, damn, you just left me with your fucking garbage. And that red robe was totally in the fucking pile of stuff. And I was like, I'm going to wear that shit then. I was like, Fuck I'm going to yeah. split that shit. Because I bought it for like fucking, I don't remember, fucking year back or something or whatever. I was like, fuck it, whatever. And so I just wore it as like a bathrobe. And I totally didn't even remember like wearing it the first time when I did an Instagram video until a friend of mine, she was like, oh, I love it when you do your little red robe report. It gets to, you know, like, be like we get to hang out again. And I was like, oh, the little red robe report, that's fucking, that's genius. That's what I'm going to have to call it now. And so I did, like, the very first one for, like, fuck, like two years ago, three years ago, something now. And uh, I have Pete and Pete, my cactuses in the window, they were supposed to be the weathermen for the show because we could just look out the window at the cactus and see what the weather looked like. <laughs> I haven't done that part in forever. Now that I think about it, I'll probably have to go back and do a fucking uh, What's Today's Weather episode as well. Do it, yo. Fuck yeah. Oh my god, that's so awesome. Yo, I love that. Yeah, it was a fun one. Yeah. Like, uh, my buddy Mike J, I don't know if you follow MJ 
1988 or, or what was it? <laughs> Mike Shade 89 or something like that. Oh, yeah. Mike Shade, Mike Shade 1980 on Instagram. He makes some of the most incredible recyclers and whatnot, man. The guy is fucking absolutely phenomenal artist. And, oh, man. I totally just had a brain fart where I was going with that. Oh, yeah. So he's going to buy me a new robe because he bitches about my robe all the time. He was like, fucking, you need a new robe. That robe's like all the dirty and shit. I'm like, yeah, What's but that's with your robe. This part yeah, right. It's aged like fine wine. We'll see. It's been a while. I could probably use a new one. I've looked at her a couple online, but there's something about that color red and whatnot. Like I haven't seen anything like it similar. <coughs> <laughs> oh, that was a big fat <clears throat> Oh, yeah. <coughs> mm. <coughs> that was fucking delicious. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. So, yeah. uh, I, got, I got another question for you that's uh, a little What's bit up? of a side note. <clears throat> well, okay. Wait, actually, hold on. I'm going to I'm going to do that question later. First off, I want to I want, someone was curious about um, <coughs> your appearance in high school and uh it was pretty uh pretty wild is what I've heard. I apparently I think I've probably seen a couple pictures on your story but I can't like put it to my Oh man, I'll have to send you the the one that they're probably talking about. So, back in high school like I, I was saying I used to grow up like hella poor and shit. And so I had all that angst and fucking teenage bullshit and everything. So I used to be a goth kid, right? And so <laughs> the fucking, I used to wear like the chain collar with the spikes on it and shit. And I had a haircut that probably nobody else would ever really have where I had about like 16 inch long spikes that were bangs that came down straight in front of my eyes, like down to my chest. And then like a six inch tall mohawk and like five spikes up the middle and like a trihawk where like the whole sides were all flared all the way down to the back. And it used to take me like probably 20, 30 minutes in the morning and like a couple of squirts of Elmer's glue. And I just like slap it in my hair and throw together this like ridiculous fucking hairdo, blow dry it real quick and then fucking go to school. And I had like this fucking, it looked like a lizard or some shit, like fucking ridiculous, terrible haircut and fucking black trench coat, fucking tall boots with the straps and all that. I went to Hot Topic all the time and fucking, you know, I was that Definitely. fucking, it was like before emo was a thing and goth was still the thing, you know, where like fucking, and like scene kids weren't a thing yet either. It was totally back in the fucking 90s and shit. Back in the, so, yeah, oh yeah, dude, you were the, the OG fucking, that's crazy, dude. I gotta see that picture because that sounds like an iconic hairdo that nobody's ever had before. Honestly, dude, it's it's pretty funny. Uh, I'm trying to remember. There's a single hashtag that I put on it that I'll have to I'll, I'll figure out which one it was, and it links right to it because it's just such a funny thing. But it was my most liked picture of 2018 or whatever when I had put it up. <laughs> There was like ten thousand fucking likes on it or some shit. I was like, Jesus Christ, dude, that's insane! Like everybody thought it was fucking hilarious, and it, I'm just so glad to know that like fucking it's uh it's looked back on so fondly, and like fucking there wasn't so much negativity about it. You know, there was a lot of people that were like, you know, good job for for being you and whatnot, and not a lot of people being like, oh, you goofy, you know, goofball, whatever, fucking negative comment that they got. 100%, yo, I think that's fucking awesome, seriously. That's crazy. That sounds yeah, like, but, uh, you know, like I said, the, probably one of the craziest hairstyles that's ever been done. Dude, it was totally like, uh, I, don't know, I don't even remember where it came from. I just had the idea, like, fuck, I'm going to make this shit like fucking nobody else someone yeah. said like an anime character is what is it oh okay like yeah okay very similar yeah in that way where like there's the hair in front of your eyes kind of thing it yeah. totally like af after this i'll totally link you to it and you'll see it's, it's I gotta hilarious see, I gotta see. it's gonna be great so i gotta ask you about uh about mushrooms oh yeah yeah for sure actually it's daylight you want to see some yeah i would love to 
All right. Well, yeah, here, we'll go for a little walk. I'll show you some mushrooms out in the yard here. I totally got a, like a little cultivation section going out here. And one of them is still doing really well where I'm time-lapsing it. And uh, instead of doing like, uh, you know, the time-lapse where you harvest at the peak point in the mushroom life, I'm going to let them completely rot into the ground. Oh, okay. So, so here... Well, just, just to catch it on film. But so here I have, these are psilocybe cyanescence. And these are magic mushrooms. These are the ones that grow native in Washington oh, here. That's dope. What? That's so fucking and they're, they're beautiful. And then over here, I have, these ones are ones that are rotting away, where they're all past their prime. They're all gross and nasty. Oh, yeah. But I have this camera watching them here. And they're time lapse. Oh, that's exactly, awesome. yeah. So they went from like the little itty bitty teeny pins like this and everything to the bigger mushrooms like this, completely rotting away. And it's all been it's about forty five days now that it's been in time lapse. So I'm gonna be able to wow. see almost a month and a half worth of time lapse and just catch it all and watch it. That's beautiful. It's gonna be so cool. That's so I'm super dope. excited about it. Wow. And I got. I'll show you. I'll send you a link. I did a raw edit dump on on my GoPro one. I had another one in my cellar, where because the ones out here, I've had to keep spraying them with a hose and shit during days when it's not raining and whatnot. I wanted to get one done faster, so I did one indoors and I set it up to where the um, the like Mister basically sprayed the mushrooms for me, and I put them in like a little cardboard box and I put the like a new GoPro nine with a macro lens on it. So the first time I've ever used like a nicer camera compared to that shitty GoPro thing that's out there taking that time lapse now. And it took like a 4K super up close, like full 30 days of the mushrooms from babies all the way to finish, like in super HD. And it looks amazing. Oh, that's crazy. I'm stoked. But I got a buddy that's doing an edit on it. And uh, and so that edit's going to be fucking coming out in a couple of weeks or so. And it'll have like all sorts of like cool movement and shit done to it. But I'll show you the, the ride. It. I'll send you a link on it later. Definitely. I'd love to see it. Hell yeah. That's so awesome. Yo, I I would love to get out and do some more foraging here. Like, I know that there's a bunch of crazy um, mushrooms that grow in Oregon as well that people forage for. I just don't know exactly. I got I to gotta hit up some of my homies that do foraging and be like, where should I go? You know? And oh, out. man. Yeah, there's Good so things. many different things to look for. It all depends on what you want to find. And then you just got to learn it's all about habitat hunting more than actual mushroom hunting. You're looking for the areas that the mushrooms might be more than just the mushrooms themselves. And once you get that down, then you can just find them all over. Oh, okay. You just recognize the habitat. You know, like this combination of trees or this combination of like soil conditions and, and like uh, coastal conditions or riverbank or something like that, you know, things are going to form in those areas. And so when you find yourself in those areas, you got to know what time of year it is. And then there's the probability of finding certain mushrooms. It's a, it's pretty involved until you just pick one and then you figure out, you're like, Oh, okay. During this time of year, these places I'll find this mushroom. And then you just find that one a bunch and it's a really fun time. And then you start expanding and finding more and more. Yo, it's kind of fucking crazy. Honestly, I saw this post on, um, when you made the post this morning saying that you were going to be on Cheers Yo, someone followed me that um, does a lot of mushroom information. I made this post of one of their homies like that went to Canada and got all these mushrooms. They were they weren't um, like uh, psychedelic mushrooms, but they were just edible mushrooms. And it was a, literally like an entire fucking truckload of these. Oh, and they were yeah. wild foraged mushrooms. It's like, bro, that's literally insane. How much money of mushrooms was that? That's my homie Andrew with Inoculate the West, and he is totally one of those like people that's inspired by the fungus and the business behind it, like uh, Paul Stamets, where there's a lot of people out there really interested in mushrooms, and they go out and forage areas. All those mushrooms came from one giant forest fire area. It wasn't like a farm like making these mushrooms. In nature, when the forest fires go through and destroy like acres and acres and acres of forest, the very next year, there's thousands of pounds of, of those edible uh, morel mushrooms growing out there in those burn sites. 
And so people will go out there in, in huge teams, like driven by helicopters and whatnot, or flown out there and dropped off to be able to hunt these things. And they'll pull in those, you know, thousands of pounds of dried mushrooms because they're worth, like if you go to the grocery store and you want to buy one, it's five or six dollars per dried little mushroom, basically, in the bag to be able to put it in your soup or anything and make it, you know, taste really delicious. <clears throat> but it's because of all the effort that went into going and getting them. It makes it so valuable. It's such an incredible, like, uh, like a market side that, like, people think about farming beef or making uh, vegetables or things like that, and it's really kind of a stationary event. But when you're getting mushrooms like that, it's exactly the same as like learning to go and hunt them. You have to find areas that naturally produce giant amounts of mushrooms and people that you can get out there and ways to do it to harvest them all in a two week period, basically, because that's all the time in the whole year that you have is like two weeks out of the whole year. Is prime time for one kind of mushroom of any kind, basically. And it's yeah. so cool to see that like so many people are interconnected in that world, and it's cool to hear you know Andrew pop up here too. And Oxley the West, super cool guy, does phenomenal work, spreads like all the great information. I want to see that dude do well, man. I oh, really yeah, wish him definitely. Yo, his his account seemed really cool. I had to drop the follow there and check it out. And when I saw that post with all those mushrooms, I was like, damn, that's crazy, yo. And th that to hear that they were all wildly forged, you know, I saw that on that post. I was like, that is just. Literally insane, man. That's fucking nuts. Dude, it's so cool. I mean, it's like almost all mushrooms that when you find those like giant areas of it, it's incredible to think about the potential of the organism, like what it's actually doing to the environment there, where if the burns didn't have all those mushrooms in it, would they be able to heal as fast and would the forest grow back? It's just like, it's a whole other kingdom that people leave out in the world when they think about uh, animals and plants and the relationship between the two, there's mushrooms in there too. And they're a huge bridge in between everything. Like Definitely. they're just such a fascinating thing. Whoa. They're kind of in themselves. Mushrooms are kind of like a bridge between like the, the life and death. In a sense oh, absolutely. Them. They are the great recyclers. Like they take, and uh, that's okay. So take, for example, the cyan essence, like the ones that I was just showing you outside. They're a magic mushroom, but that's a byproduct of what they do naturally, where they're a remediation species. When you do damage to the environment or a storm or a landslide or a fire or something takes out a large amount of, of forest and acreage, it produces all the detritus and the broken uh, wood and like, all that that uh, material is substrate for these mushrooms to live on basically because now the trees are dead what does a dead tree do other than rot away and so the cyanescence go in there and they eat the lignin that's in the trees the most complex molecule that makes up between the cellulose fibers of the tree lignin is like the liquid glue that holds together all the cellulose and the mushrooms eat all that glue that holds together all that cellulose and make a uh, fixed nitrogen for the next plants that are going to grow in that soil available so that the dirt isn't just acidic, nasty hash or terrible, like, rotten, fucking nasty mud or, like, uh, mud. It turns into fertile soil that's ready to be thrown in again. So, like, certain mushrooms eat stuff and certain mushrooms are attached to things and just exchange nutrients between the two so not all mushrooms are out there dissolving stuff just the cyan essence are in there fixing the damage that's done to the environment they fix all the nitrogen for grass and flowers and and other trees to grow back in the place of everything that's just been destroyed definitely it's fucking insane you know it's kind of crazy to think about how how they affect us you know on a on a psyche level with what in connection to what their whole purpose is in the first place. It's kind of exactly. And what makes it really funny is when you think about the most common places to find them are actually where people have tried to do their best to recreate nature. If you go to a habitat restoration zone or generally it's actually government buildings and the landscaping around government buildings because they try and make it as natural to the environment as possible. 
they use wood chips in the landscaping as a fertilizer for all of the, the plants so they don't have to have sprinklers and fertilizers and things to keep the trees growing they just go dump wood chips out in big giant beds around the bases of the trees and it just so happens that that's the cremo habitat for magic mushrooms to grow in so where people are trying to fix it around the government buildings and whatnot they're in there doing their best to actually fix it and it's just funny to think too that the places that grow them most are usually the places that you'd be in the most trouble if you were to be caught with them basically really funny, like, honestly. <laughs> yeah they're always around like police stations and courthouses and fucking like the um commission centers for the city and like a bunch of different like uh well, okay so like elementary schools is another one that's kind of funny right? where like elementary schools they plant plantings and then instead of having fertilizers around the kids because spraying chemicals is bad around children they put wood chips everywhere and the wood chips act as the fertilizer but the only reason the wood chips act as the fertilizer is because magic mushrooms grow in them and it's just like the, <laughs> the funniest darn thing that like you'll see the whole backside of an elementary school will just be a giant flush of magic mushrooms during the like fall and it's like wow Wow, that's that's amazing to see and so funny at the same time. Oh, it's so funny, yo. That's really it's such good. a different thing to like where you imagine most people see the magic mushrooms are in like the Oregon or not Oregon, like below Oregon, down in the uh like equatorial belt. Like everything like Florida, New Mexico, California, they all have the cabenzies that grow in the cow pastures outside. And so that's the the mushroom that most people associate with magic mushrooms. But here in Washington and Oregon, we have like a whole nother list of like 12 other species that live on wood and grass and things instead. And they're just way cooler, totally cooler fucking mushrooms. Man. Oh, yeah. 100%. The coastal ones here, the azurescents that grow in the dune grass at the beach are the most potent mushrooms on the planet. And they just so happen to be here, like, fucking, you know, 20, 30 miles away. It's That's like, great. Are they <laughs> easy to find? Uh, relatively. I mean, like, if you, again, if you're a habitat hunter, you hunt the habitat and you'll be able to find them. That's crazy. That's so yeah. dope. That's so dope. That's great. I wonder how far away that is from Oregon. Pretty far. No, I mean, you got the Oregon coast. You think they, they, they're they at the Oregon coast, too? Oh, absolutely. They go from... British Columbia to the Bay Area. Oh. They, they run the, the whole western seaboard, pretty much. That's crazy. The homie in chat says he's coming to Oregon. Let's go. <laughs> yeah, right? Well, now that it's legal in Oregon, that's the thing. Is like, it's interesting. I wonder what the rules are going to be about where... So if you can possess two dry grams of, of any drug or whatever in Oregon, or two grams in oregon i wonder with mushrooms if that's dry or wet what they're going to consider well, that i think that i think you can still get a fine though if you have them yeah well and so in oregon it's only a misdemeanor as it is anyhow if you get caught with them just picking them on the beach as it is there's like uh, a couple of different different spots up in uh astoria basically that are famous for people getting caught picking mushrooms because they're just fucking everywhere up there. But when you get caught, it's like a hundred and eighty dollar fine or something like that in Oregon. And in Washington it's a felony. Oh so, shit. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. Oh, what? That's ridiculous. Yeah, so you gotta hunt in Oregon. It's the only place to go. That's crazy as fuck. Wow. Hundred and eighty dollars is not that bad of a bad of a Find yeah, it compared to um, a felony charge. Yeah, exactly, right? And now because it's not necessarily like a possession charge, I bet in Oregon you're more likely going to be charged with like um, a removal of state property, right? So if you go like cut a tree down on state land, you'll get in trouble for removal of state property. But if you're harvesting mushrooms without a permit on state land, you get removal of state property or whatever. And so I bet that'll more likely be the charge that you're actually stuck with over possession because you can get, you know. Can you get a mushroom permit? Is that a thing? Yeah, so that's the other interesting part is like once you have a mushroom harvesting permit, what mushrooms does that limit you to, you know? Like, can you harvest magic mushrooms? And then like, 
I don't know. It's there's a lot of like I'm sure that the lawyers in Oregon are gonna have a fucking heyday with this over the next like few years figuring out well, eventually. The thing is, what right they now they just that. they just legalized psilocybin for medicinal as well in Oregon with the last with legalizing or with decriminalizing drugs. They also legalized prescription psilocybin. But I don't yeah. know to what extent. I'm not 100 percent sure. I didn't look super far into it. I was just like. I was like, should we, it was, it was like, should we legalize psilocybin for medicinal uses? And I was like, fuck yes, yeah. we should. 100%. Absolutely. Really funny, like a day after, or like maybe like a couple of weeks after we passed that in Oregon, a study came out, not from Oregon, I'm pretty sure, that showed that fucking psilocybin is four times as effective as the leading antidepressant. Dude, yeah, it's amazing, man. I quit smoking overnight from a psilocybin dose from smoking cigarettes for 10 years to a cold Turkey the next day after a huge dose of mushrooms one time. And I was like, man, I, I got like fucking all the confidence that it's possible for anybody else to be able to do it as well. It has like all the, po the positive effects that the antidepressants are supposed to have basically put in an all natural form. Definitely. Wow, that's that's amazing, dude. That's fucking awesome, yo. yo yeah, it was a cool... Like, I found a patch of mushrooms. Like, what I just showed you outside, that's like a very... Uh, like, a modest find. Like, if you were to find that, you'd be really excited about it because there's a decent amount there. But I found an area that was the size of a football field covered from end to end. Like, the whole thing. To where I was, like, harvesting it with, like, garden shears, like the big hedge clippers and duffel bags, just, like, stuffing them full. And I was like, oh, my God, this is insane. Like, and so and I had to eat so many because I couldn't, like, disrespect the patch and be like, oh, I just harvested, like, all these mushrooms from it, you know. I can't just not eat a ton. And I ate so many, I woke up the next day and I didn't smoke cigarettes anymore. I was like, oh, okay, cool. Wow, that's, totally that's beautiful, yo. That's crazy. That's amazing. That's the mushrooms giving back to you right there. Yeah, man. I totally, I respect them for that. And so I just like, I like spreading them and doing everything I can to like, like uh, my last giveaway, I put a bunch of those uh, Azure Essence on a t-shirt. So those four prints are all over the t-shirt. And I sent that out to a guy that like now wherever he wears it, like the spores will fly off and who knows, you never know. They might make some mushrooms somewhere, you know? Yo, that's crazy. That's lit. That's super awesome. That'd be a good one. Oh, that's beautiful. It's really nice. I like that. Uh, are you ready to take another dab? Yeah, absolutely, man. Let's get it. Let's see what I got to dab on again this time. Thinking. Yeah, I'm going to go for some cheeky hunt here. I got some, uh, some other BHO that's not so so terpy. It's just more like the regular. Nice. Like, nice a, wet, a nice, consistent wet sugar. Yeah, exactly. Wet sugar. That's a great... I like that consistency. I think that is my favorite consistency, is a wet sugar that's terpy enough to have flavor, but not so terpy that you take a dab and you're like, oh my god, it burns my throat. You know. Yeah, the ones when it hurts too much, man, it's just not worth it. There's something about, like, when you separate the diamonds and the sauce too far, then it gets, like, either all diamondy or all saucy where when it's a wet sand it's that like it's perfect mix of it they it's all nicely dissolve homogenized is what it is yeah. when you separate exactly. it too much it's it's just uh it's unnecessary separation in my opinion it can be it can also be a unique thing we're like man if you ever use one of those electric uh little vape pens you just put the hte just straight in there oh yeah, you're so right. You're so right. Just putting that in one of those vape carts, you know? Oh, yeah. oh so man. delicious. Yeah, it doesn't so even have delicious. to get you that high. It's just like, it's nice to go for a walk and just puff on that, you know? Yeah, and it's just straight terps. Yeah, it's so tasty. I mean, it's still like a, a buddy of ours did a like a uh, like an extraction thing for a while. And he was saying that the HTE was still testing out at like 30% THC. Definitely. And it's not even just the THC that gets you high, I think, is, is why when you're puffing on those, you still get pretty high over time, you know. Um, each dab that you take, you'll get 
you'd be like, whoa, I can kind of feel it creeping up. You know, and like after five dabs, you're like, oh, wait, shit. And after like 10, you're like, oh, fuck. And it's really is, especially when it's that, it's mostly just the terps, you know, so it's the terps in that blend, it gets you decently high. And if you're already high, it'll just get you even higher. Yeah, it totally gets you. How'd that blowing go? Yeah. Did uh, so get all gooped up? <laughs> That's funny. Nate's been having an interesting day on the lathe, making stuff today. <laughs> Some days it's like that as a glass blower, man. It's like hit or miss. Like, you know, they say a uh, writer's block or something like that, you know? Same kind of thing with artists, like, except for, okay, and I guess your pages don't shatter and your face piss you off, like, you know? That's the worst part, man. Like, you'd be working Glass on something. is Boom. very unforgiving. It's the most unforgiving medium that there is, honestly. Totally. I mean, I've but at the same it. time, it's so, like, uh, satisfying when it works right, you know? Yeah, it's just, like, the gamble is so worth it, you know? 100%. The end product makes it worth it. 110%. Corn, um, this is Jeff Glass, who makes the reclaimers, like this right here, the reclaimer that I have on my rig. Yeah, sure. I got to send you some fresh pucks, man. I got some black ones now. Some, like, oh, yeah. Free, yeah, oh, God, that'd be dope. Yeah, dude, I'll tell you. I'll hook you up. Oh, yeah. Yo, so I got, I got one more question for you. So, yeah, what's that? Are you into tea at all? Oh, okay. So, yeah, like, with the mushrooms and doing the tea, I think that, um, so, like, you're a chemist, really. You, you do extractions and shit. Osmosis really only occurs up to a certain point at a certain temperature and a certain dilution. So, like, tea doesn't ever get you everything that's in the mushroom. And so... I feel like with Cubenzies, the mushroom that everybody's pretty familiar with being a magic mushroom, because of the concentration of the chemicals in it, you're better off doing tea to get the desired result without the ingestion of all the mushroom material. Because if you got to eat like three or four grams of mushroom, you're not going to digest that dry mushroom. And so your stomach is really not happy about having it in there, you know? And it upsets some people. They get like a stomach a stomach ache during it. And tea solves that by not having the mushroom material. You're only getting psilocybin, basically. But with the mushrooms that grow here in Washington, the potency level on them is so much higher that I prefer personally to grind them into a powder and mix them in with chocolate and then mm. pour them into little molds or not. Okay, yeah, I've definitely seen homies make the mushroom chocolates before. Yeah, dude, it's so much better because of the way that it just goes into your digestive system and the way that it, it's like, so the experience of it too, like uh, back in the day when like ecstasy was a big deal and whatnot, people all had their chosen pill, their fucking green Rolex or blue transformer, whatever the fucking name of it was. With the mushrooms, that's kind of like, Everyone has their, like, oh, I've got the penis envy. I've got the fucking Taj Mahal. I've got the Golden Teacher. They've all got their, their different kinds. And I feel like the chocolate is just another, like, side of that. Like, another, a memorable way to have the experience. Like, some, some title to put on the experience where you can be like, the time that I had the Golden Teachers was a really good time. The time that I had the penis envy wasn't or whatever. And so people will steer clear of certain things because of their experiences or gravitate towards them. And so like, I think that'll be that next step in the, the legalization of mushrooms will be in those forms of either teas or chocolates or things that you can be like, oh, yeah, I like it this way, but not that way, even though it's all the same thing. Yeah, you know? Really. Hundred percent, yeah. Steepable bags of some sort. So yeah, how about, absolutely. How about other tea? Do you drink like uh, any like caffeinated teas of any sorts? Oh, yeah, not so much. I did uh, have coffee a bit, but I uh, I don't really drink too much tea or coffee anymore. Definitely. You a tea fan? 
Well, I, so I, uh, I used to drink Red Bulls. Like, I would drink, like, a Red Bull a day. And then I was like, this is so terrible. And so I, someone recommended yerba mate because it's super oh, yeah. caffeine, right? So I started drinking a couple of these, and I was like, this is so expensive. And it feels like I'm drinking crack. <laughs> <laughs> but okay so it's good it's i still like them right but it does it just feels like it's a little bit kind of crazy and one yeah, of my like homies has been like doing the like tea sessions you know like we have like tea sessions you like fucking have your thing and you like fucking do all that and you drink like several several cups and whatnot um and so he's been doing research into different teas and he recommended this tea that comes from china that's like this crazy fermented tea called poo air or something like that and i think it should be arriving today so i'm excited to try it out oh, right on. but i think that some teas have a certain euphoric effect that is somewhat like a high and it's called like a tea high and so i'll let you know how it is yeah, interesting uh, very interested it wasn't like crazy expensive you know it was like i did the math and i was like it's cheaper to drink this caffeine wise even than drinking the yerba mates out the cans you know yeah no that's really interesting i wonder what other chemicals are in it that the that the high is produced from that's exactly what I was really curious about as well. I'm like, huh, I don't know. I know there's a bunch of different types of teas too, so I'm curious yeah, to kind well, of start like that. That. What's that one uh, a lot of people are doing that uh, Kratom or Kratom? Oh, yeah, is that a type of tea? Well, you can use it like tea, basically. Like, if you steep it, the, the, the chemicals will still kind of come out into the water and you can kind of get the stuff out of it but most people they just like you know Those parachute powder. yeah 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 i heard i uh kratom's totally legal here in oregon i see it sold a lot of places it's like a uh kind of like a sedative of some sort right yeah so it is an opiate and by like uh like chemical breakdown like it it's in that family of opiates but it's not in the ones that are regulated by the government of opiates where like it's not um i think of so like um opium just straight up from the poppy and whatnot is illegal and then it's acetylized opium so like heroin is illegal but the opiates that are in kratom are not illegal because they're not governed in the verbiage that makes the um uh, derivatives basically of of it illegal it's mm-hmm. not covered in it like morphine and all the other ones and those are all governed but because it's a different style it's not technically illegal and so that's why some places have decided that it is illegal because it is technically an opiate by structure and so they've classified it as an opiate where it's it's different enough some places are like no it's okay because they've seen the semi-positive effects in some of the community about the like the reduction in heroin use and pill use and whatnot in people because it has a similar opiate effect on your body that in large doses you can like use it to wean yourself off of it a lot of people like use it to get off of heroin and get off of pills and stuff (laughs) because it's legal but it's expensive to do so I see. Oh, shit. Yeah, I didn't realize that. That's fucking dope. Yeah, what I, I had heard that uh, some soccer moms, you know, like they mix it in their tea and get super nicely uh, sedated. But as a medicinal, medicinal properties, being able to potentially help someone lean off of heroin or something, that's incredibly beneficial, you know, especially if I don't know the the negative effects of it. Um, I haven't looked too much into it. But. Well, the only negative effects that that are really there is just abuse of the substance itself. Where, like, in the same way that it has, like, uh, opiates have an effect on your body, it has opiates, so it has an effect on your body. And so in large doses, it still becomes a money drain and it still becomes a negative effect on your body if you abuse it, just like anything. But, like, the people that are going to usually abuse it to that point are most likely going to step to the next cheapest option versus that, you know, and that's where it could be dangerous in that way for people that never started with heroin, but, you know, maybe try and create them too many times 
And that's, you know, there's always a possibility of things being, you know, good or bad. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's why it'll be really interesting to see Oregon's new drug laws, whether or not it's going to be a positive or negative effect on the, you know, the criminality rate of it and the usage rate. That's the the big difference, I guess. I think that the biggest thing is that Oregon recognizes that there's a lot of people that are going to do drugs regardless of what they do. And that um, being a drug addict or using drugs and being a criminal are not synonymous, right? You can be a drug addict and a criminal. You can be a criminal and a drug addict, or you can be just a drug addict, or you can be just a criminal. But you yeah. it doesn't just because you're a drug addict doesn't mean you're a criminal. So why should Absolutely. we put drug addicts in prison with, um, you know, fucking people that steal from people, people that fucking beat people or, you know, whatever it may be. Uh, well, it's like alcohol in that way where, like, the only alcoholics that are imprisoned are ones that are operating motor vehicles or intoxicated in public. Other than that, in the privacy of their own home or in the public of a bar, as long as they're within standards and control, it's totally socially acceptable to be inebriated on on a intoxicant. It's not necessarily anything different than any other drug. It's just the one that we've all decided is okay. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. Hey, hell, hell yeah! Someone in the chat said they've been trying to scoop a reclaimer forever. Well, Jeff just did a new yeah. order. Um, at what's what was the Instagram? Inhale Bliss three sixty five. Inhale Bliss three sixty five. You could DM them yeah. on Instagram, and they'll probably have what you're looking for. Absolutely, yeah. I'm about to mail. Actually, as soon as we get off uh, this year, I'm going to run to the post office and drop the boxes off, and they'll be available for sale soon. Hell yeah, yo, Jeff. It's been so fucking lit, man. It's been really nice chatting with you. Speaking of that, I don't want to keep you too long. Uh, Absolutely. Oh yeah, shit, dude. It's been almost yeah. an hour and a half. Yeah, I just <laughs> realized that we were we were going pretty uh pretty deep here. But if you want to take another dab, I'm definitely about it. Absolutely, yeah. I'm down to take. I'm take a big old fatty finish here. Yeah, let's do it, dude. Yeah, run it town. Get all the errands done. Definitely, yo. Well, you know, whenever you end up having uh, some availability of some uh, some catchers, let me know. I'd love to scoop some up. Yeah, I'll definitely set you up as soon as I got a little free time in my schedule. It's been an amazing year. I want to thank everybody for all the love and support and the product. It's just been phenomenal. The demand is far out outweigh the supply. I cannot make them not fast enough. And People it's, fucking it's love them, dude. They're, perfect. They're, they're turning into a necessity, you know? It's one of the things I was hoping to make an industry standard one day where, like, it should just be a thing that, like, you use. Like, everybody's got a carb cap. Everybody's got a banger. Why don't you got a reclaimer? Facts, you know? yo, facts. I haven't made if enough you dab of them. so much, what's the point of getting your rig so dirty with reclaim that you're just going to fucking lose? When you could save it all. Yeah, absolutely. And especially on people that take like the uh, turp slurper globs that are just like <laughs> all down the nail and everything. Oh, yeah, dude. Seriously. Yeah, I think the turp slurper is a silly thing, but I love it. You know? I've never used one before. I think they're silly too, but I've never used one. I kind of want to. It's, it's surface area, really. Like the pearls and the swirly cap has a very similar effect. Oh, yeah. But uh, it's just the amount of oil touching hot glass at one time is insane with those. And so you just get super thick ribs. Fatty clouds. I see people like they're dumping like grams into it, bro. <laughs> yeah, but then like that Dirty Arm Farm video yesterday. And you see that where they slurp that nail down. They oh, throw dude. like a. Jesus, yo. Oh, man. That Holy was, a little... was way too hot. Oh my! <laughs> Calm down there, Nail. Oh my god, dude. That's like well, the hottest stab. Oh my god, I should have felt it. I didn't realize That's it was so that hot. Weird. Oh my god. And when it's really terpy like that, the terps are so flammable. That's what it is, dude. It was the fucking terps. That was a diamond dab, and it was apparently... Oh my god, dude. <laughs> Way too hot. Should I even smoke that? That's so funny. It happens. Should be okay.
That's crazy, dude. I haven't had a dab catch on fire for years. I've been ripping the e-nail for forever, man. I love the e-nail option. It's just one of those things where it's always ready. And with the reclaimer, the e-nail is like its best friend because it keeps the nail warm. All that oil just keeps sliding down the nail and just right into the reclaimer. True, dude. <coughs> Yeah. <laughs> they all fatty gaps. Yeah, that was. Yeah. It's been a blast. That's crazy. Always a pleasure okay, talking yeah, to man. Out. Jeff, thank you so much. Once again, everyone, if you want to catch Jeff, uh, check him on his Instagram at Jeff Glass Art. Thank you very much, man. Yeah, thank I'll make you sure so much, Jeff. Again. It's been fucking lit, man. Seriously, we'll talk yeah, about it. Yeah, absolutely. Soon. We'll have to do it again sometime. It's only episode nine. I'll have to reprise. Oh, I would back. love that. I would absolutely love that, man. It's been great. Enjoy the rest of the day. Get that shit done. I appreciate you. Thank you so much for sharing uh, your love for everything with all of us. We really appreciate it, man. Awesome, awesome. Thanks so much, man. Thanks, man. Have a great Thanks night. Soon. Yeah, you too.